But before we go any further, why don't we start off with this simple truth. And the truth is this. God will take what we have if we don't use it. God will take what we have if we don't use it. This truth is so important that Jesus told a story about it. He wanted to make sure everybody got and understood this, this truth that God will take what we have if we don't use it. And we see it in Luke chapter 19, verses 24 through 26. He's talking about this king. And it says, The king ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied. And to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. You see, it may be your money. It may be your health. It may be relationships. It may may be a job. But if we don't use what God has given us for His glory, then He will take from us what He's given us. You do understand what you have been given in life, whether it be your genetic makeup, whether it be the two arms, the two legs, the, 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 your, arm, your body, what you have been given, your marriage, your family, your children, what you have been given, if you don't use it the way God intended, God's liable to take it. There will be a high price to pay. You're saying, Randy, what do you mean by that? Well, for example, you do understand that you are in a church that focuses on biblical preaching you do understand that's the only definition of success when it comes to preaching the preaching is good only not because the preacher has a long beard not because the music is great the preaching is only good when it takes the word of God and gives it to the people of God and makes it clear makes it known and it changes our life And so if you've been coming to this church for six minutes or six days or six years or ten years, you have heard biblical preaching. Well, here's the problem with that. God has given you much, and what God gives, He expects something in return. Notice what Jesus says in Luke 12, 48. When someone has been given much, Much will be required in return, and when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. You see, you think you're here just to get your ears tickled. You think you're here because you want to get beat up or or maybe encouraged or, or maybe you're just trying to alleviate some guilt or make some friend happy. You think you're here for that, but the Bible says you are being given the Word of God in clear, unadulterated language, and since you have been given much, much will be required from you. That's why James 1.22 says this, but don't just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourself. And so with that truth in mind, with those verses in mind, I have a question for those of you who have been here the last couple of weeks, and the question is this, what have you done with Colossians 3? What have you done with Colossians 3? Have you made sure that you're really saved? Have you identified and defeated and killed your flesh? Have you ruined your past? Have you let Jesus live through you? Have you destroyed that prejudice that made some of you so upset last week that I dared talk about it? What have you done with Colossians 3? What have you done with the Word of God that has been planted in your heart and planted in your soul? Because if you don't do something, I'm afraid for you. You see, you're in danger of 2 Peter 2.21. Notice it says, It would be better if they had never known the way of righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. You're saying, Randy, why would it be better for me not to hear the Word of God? Why would it be better for me not to hear biblical preaching? Why would it have been better for me not to come to the series on Colossians 3? Why? Because 2 Peter 2.20 says this, They are worse off than before. And that's where some of you are right now. You see, you think you can come to church and just ignore what's being said, let it tickle your ears, let it, let it come into, uh, just go, wash over you and do nothing with it? And nothing's going to happen. Oh, that's, no. In fact, I used to say this. I used to say, hey, invite people to church. You don't have to pray about it. Just invite them to church. Just get them to church. Get them to church. It doesn't matter. Just come on. You bring them to church, and God will deal with them once they get there. Now, what God has been telling me lately, and I've been telling some of you, is be careful who you ask to church. 
Be careful. Why? Because if God's not calling them and their heart's not willing and open to listen, then they'll come to church and they'll be worse off than they were when they came. We see it happening all the time. I, I'm, I'm thinking of 10 people right now that are worse off now than, than they were when they came to Freedom Family Church at the beginning of this series. So with that in mind, I'm afraid for you. Please do not sit here. Some of you might, we're getting ready to pray. Some of you might, while I'm praying, get up and quietly make an exit because if you don't listen and you don't put into practice what God's saying to you, you will be worse off than you were when you walked in. So let's pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes, every head bow. God, your word is alive and active, and I'm praying that your word will put a holy fear, a holy reverence in us right now. That we don't think that this is some show, we don't think that this is some TV show that we can watch and, and, and just enjoy and then go off and never change our life. Oh God, I'm asking that a holy fear of God will wash over everyone in this room, that a holy fear, the holy fear of God will wash over everybody that watches this video and may they take seriously what your word is telling us today. Lord, I pray especially for those who've gone through this series and yet have never changed. They're, they're no, no different. In fact, some of them are already getting worse. Oh God, change their heart. Change their life. Rescue them from perishing. Rescue them before they are destroyed. And those around them. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Now with that in mind. Let's read Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12. If you haven't been here, we've already covered the first 11 verses. But let's read Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 12 now, because God's got some things that he wants to share with you today. And he says in verse 12, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must... Forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And so what have we been seeing? You see, Colossians 3, 1 through 4 talked about how we get a new heart and a new life at salvation. And, and it lays the foundation for what true... By the way, true Christianity is not avoiding sin. True Christianity is you getting a new heart and a new life. And once you get that, though, then the Bible has been saying that there are certain jobs that Christians have to do. The Bible has been telling us through Colossians 3 that Christians have a flesh to identify and a flesh to kill. The Bible's been sitting there telling us that, you know what, we have to ruin our past, that our past should no longer be glorified. It should be ruined so that, that our kids and us won't be tempted to go back. We need, we need to let Jesus live through us, and we need to destroy any and all prejudices in our heart and our life. Well, he's not done. We still have got other things. You're saying, Randy, what's the first thing God wants us to do today? Well, we notice that Christians have choices to make. Christians have choices to make. Go back to verse 12. He says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves. Now, before we go any further, notice the three key words there. As you're reading the Bible, don't just gloss over it. There's key words that should be popping out at you under the Holy Spirit's uh, leadership. That the three words that God wants us to notice today, and the three words are chose, holy, and loves. What does he mean by chose? Now, some people say, well, you know what? You don't have any free will. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter if you pray. Let me give you the biblical definition of chose. It means selected. It means to be made a favorite. It means to be called out and invited. That's what it means to chose. We see the same word in Ephesians 1.4. It says, even before God made the world, God loved us and he chose us. What? He called us out. He invited us. He selected us in Christ to be made holy and without, fruit, without fault in his eyes. Now, what does he mean by holy? Because we get that all mixed up. You are called to be a holy people. You are called to be holy on Monday. What does that mean? It means to be physically pure and internally blameless. What's he mean there? He's saying that we make choices to where we do not defile this body called God's temple because the moment you get saved, your body becomes the temple of God. And some of you right now would never even think about defiling this room right here. You would never even think about your old mama's, grandmama's uh, old sanctuary, but yet you defile this bodily temple by the way you eat, by the way you drink, and the sexual immorality that you commit. And he says if we're going to be holy, then we've got to be outwardly Pure. But notice he also says holiness is internal blamelessness. What does it mean to be blameless? It means, you know what? You're doing the best you can to follow God. 
If you can look yourself in the mirror, more importantly, you can look God in the eye and say, God, as much as I know I've tried to follow you, then you are blameless. But what does he mean? We we see the same word in Mark 6.20. It said, John the Baptist was a good and holy man. He was physically pure and internally blameless. Now, what does he mean by love? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, it's that that mushy, gushy feeling. No. What is love? Love is to wish someone well, to take pleasure in them, to long for, to esteem. Then we see the same word in Mark 10, 21. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love. He wished him well. He took pleasure in how close he was to the kingdom. He longed for this man to get saved, and he esteemed him greatly. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Now, don't miss it. Now, let's combine all those, combina- all those words there and understand that God chose us. He selected us. He called us and invited us out. He chose us to be what? Holy, which is physically pure and internally blameless, and loved. He wants to wish us well and to do good for us. You're saying, well, what does that look like? Well, for Christians, what that means is that God is constantly building up the good in us, and he's tearing down the bad. God's constantly building bringing things in our life that will bless us, but he's also tearing down the things that make us not holy. We see an example of that in Hebrews 12, 6. It says, For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. Now, some of you struggle with that. But you know what? I think that's more of a part of the lies that you believe from this culture that we live in. Because here's the thing. I used to work with teenagers for 11 years. And I never had to convince a teenager that discipline equaled love. They knew that when their mom and daddy disciplined them, that it meant mom and daddy loved them. In fact, I I had to do more counseling with teenagers who were upset, depressed, and discouraged because they they knew that because their parents never disciplined them, their parents didn't care about them. Right? And so, that, so the Bible is, it confirms that. It says the Lord disciplines though he's loved. He punishes each one he accepts as a child. Why? Hebrews 12, 10, 11 says God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. There's that word again. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happy and it's painful. But afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those trained in this way. What's he saying there? He's saying God uses discipline to build up the good, to tear down the bad, to, so that we can be holy and loved. Now, what happens if you're not a Christian? Say there's never been that time in your life where you've gotten a new heart, you've gotten a new life from Christ. Now, again, I'm not talking about avoiding sin. Some of you are really good at avoiding sin, and you're going to bust hell wide open. I'm talking about what happens if you're not a Christian. Say, you, you said, you know what, I don't need a new heart. I just need to tweak some things. I'm just here to fine-tune my marriage instead of giving my marriage a whole new heart. Well, this is what the Bible says in Hebrews 11, 26, 27, how God treats you. He says, if we decide to go on sinning after we have learned the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. There's nothing but fear and waiting for the judgment and the terrible fire that will destroy all those who live against God. You see, if you've been around, you've heard that salvation is about God killing the old sin nature within you and given you a new heart, a new life. And if you have rejected that, and you're like, no, I just need to work a little harder. If in the response to the, uh, to the co- confrontation of the gospel, you say, you know what? I'm just going to up my commitment level. I'm just going to do better. I'm just going to read my Bible more. I'm just... Well, then guess what? You have rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because trying harder is not good news. Good news is God saying, hey, I'm going to give you a heart transplant so that you can't help but be like Jesus. That's good news. Well, if you have rejected that in your pride, in your ego, I'm looking at a man right now who spent years saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Well, guess what? Until he got saved, the only thing that was waiting for him was hell. You see, most of you who are not saved today, you want to know why you're not concerned about God? Because God's doing nothing for you. It's just empty. And you think you're okay. No, that emptiness is a sign that judgment is coming. You're saying, Randy, how can I not be a Christian? You just read that the Bible says God chose me. Here's this fact, and the fact is this. We must choose God back to be saved. We must choose God back to be saved. We must choose God back at the beginning of our relationships. Romans 10, 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
saved. Now, what does he mean by saved there? The definition of saved in Romans 10, 13 is to be made whole. We see the same word in Matthew 1, 21. It says, Mary will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save. He will make whole his people from their sin. You see, sin is so destructive and sin is so horrible. It takes from us. It breaks us. It takes chunks of our heart and life. And so we need to be saved from our sin. We need to be made whole again through salvation. And we must choose God back at that one time where we respond to his call on our life with a call of our own, where we call upon the name of the Lord, we ask for freedom from our sin nature, and we ask for the heart of Jesus. We ask to be made whole. I talked to a woman this week. I asked her, I said, how do you know that you're saved? She didn't sit there and talk about her sin avoidance. She didn't sit there and talk about all the things that she changed in her life. This is what she said. She says, one night back in November, I was so discouraged. I was so depressed. I was laying in bed, and I was just crying. And all I could say to Jesus is, Jesus, please change me. And out of that prayer, she says, my life's never been the same. What did she do? God had selected her before time began. In that bed, in the midst of her misery, she just selected him back. She called him back. And so we must choose God back to be saved at the beginning. But guess what? We also must choose God back to be saved each morning. Joel 2.32 says, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that sounds like exactly like Romans 10.13. But can I tell you something? It's not! The word saved there means completely something totally different. It means to deliver. It means to escape. It means to set free. We see the same word in Proverbs 2.12. It says, wisdom will save you from evil people, from those whose words are twisted. You see, after we get saved, after we get our heart, a new heart and a new life, our daily job is to ask God to save us, to deliver us, to help us escape from our flesh and the evil people in this world. That's Colossians 2, 6 says this. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. You see, you think that all you got to do is cry out to God one time, and that's it. And some of you, you may have cried out to God. You may have been like that girl, and you cried out to God, and he changed you, and you haven't called out to him since. Let me explain something to you. Your job just began. Each day, each morning, God is calling out to us. Each day, each morning, God is calling out. He's wanting what? He's choosing us again so that we might be holy and loved. And our job is what? It's to call back and say, oh God, I hear you. Oh God, please deliver me. Please help me escape from my pornographic addiction. Please set me free from my lust. Please set me free from myself. And just please set me free. You say, why would I want to do that? Lamentations 3.23 says this, Great is God's faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. You, you want to know why you struggle around Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday? You want to know why my executive pastors constantly tell me I need to do something in the middle of the week to give you a pick-me-up? You want to know why? Because on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, you're living on Sunday's grace. And you're wondering why it's wearing out. God never intended you to live your Friday on Sunday's mercy. Each morning we cry out, oh God, save me from my flesh. Oh God, save me from this sinful world. Oh God, save me from my past. Oh God, save me from those who want to do me wrong. And guess what? Each morning God chooses us. And each morning we can choose him back. And so we see that Christians have choices to make. But you notice, secondly... Christians have clothes to put on. Christians have clothes to put on. And no, he's not talking about that skanky girl you've seen at other churches and everything like that. He's not talking about that woman wearing juicy at Walmart. He's not talking about that. He's talking about something else. Notice what he says in Colossians 3, 12 and 14. You must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Now, what does he mean by clothe yourself? telling Jason I struggle with that word this week what does that what does that phrase mean so I looked it up and it says this to display treasured items to dress up how about this maybe this example will help you if you knew my mom my mom had decorations for everything I mean she had so much decorations but then around Thanksgiving man that girl had a look in her eye, and she sent my daddy up into the attic, and we'd start bringing box after box after box after box after box 
after box of Christmas decorations. I mean, we really had to talk her into waiting until the day after Thanksgiving to start. We spent all Thanksgiving weekend putting Christmas decorations up. What was she doing, by the way? She was doing that word. She was clothing her house. She was arraying her house with beautiful treasured items. Now, did she have uh, Valentine's decorations upstairs? Yes. Did she have other decorations upstairs? Yes. But from November to the end of December, 1st of January, she arrayed, she displayed, she clothed our house with treasured items. She dressed it up. Right? And so that's what Jesus is talking about. We see the same root word in Mark 1, 6. It says, John the Baptist's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. Now, what was he doing there? John the Baptist was dressing like a preacher at that time. He was dressing like a prophet. He wanted everybody to know that he was a prophet. You're saying, Randy, do I need to wear camel hair clothes? Or do I need to wear a leather belt? Some of you need a belt. You're... Other stuff showing. No, God's saying that we have different clothes to wear. Put that on the screen for me. Here's a, there, here is what the Bible says your clothes should be. This is the Christian's uniform. If you are truly saved today, these are the things that God wants you to display. This is how God wants you to dress up on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is how God wants you to dress each and every day. He wants you to put on tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Now, what does he mean by tenderhearted mercy? Because most of us get that wrong. Tenderhearted mercy literally means deep feelings about other people's problems. Here's how you know if you have put on tender heart and mercy. You are at the gas station, the lady behind the counter, for whatever reason, because you've got some tattoo on your forehead that says, tell me your life story, starts telling you all about her business. If you're clothed to tender heart and mercy, you're going to sit there and go, oh, I'm sorry. An infection there? Oh, shoot. Now, if I'm not clothed to tender-hearted mercy, I will look at her and say, you should not have told me that. <laughs> right? So, I'm clothed to tender-hearted mercy. What else? Kindness. See, I, I never knew what kind meant. I knew when my mama would yell at me for not being kind, but what is kindness? It means love acted upon. You see, the Bible teaches that each morning God pours out love in our heart for other people. And so what I've got to do with that love, though, is I've got to act on it. Right? I've got to put it into practice. That means we might buy somebody's meal behind us in the drive through That means that we might do something kind for the person with us. We're expressing the love of God to people. What is humility? Humility is putting others first. By the way, let me give you a good example of you being dressed with humility, Christian. You're walking up to a door. Somebody else is walking up to the door at the same time. You stop, you open the door for them, and you let them go in. You're saying, but Randy, I beat them to the door. You're telling me what you're dressed in. God says put other people first, even if it makes you late. What is gentleness? What does he mean by gentleness? Gentleness is not what many of us think. They think that makes us a, a weenie. They think it makes us a pansy. They think it makes us a, a pathetic person. No, gentleness is power that's calm. Calm power, calm strength. Gentleness means this. You're going to know that I can break you in half, but you're going to be thankful that I didn't. Gentleness means when somebody says something stupid at work or stupid at school, and they do a lot stupid at the dinner table, you smile, and you turn, and you just keep it to yourself and share it with your son later, all right? It's gen your gentleness, right? What is patience? Patience is waiting to express anger. If you're writing notes, write this out. Jason Keller. Here's what I mean. Y'all can, can probably imagine what it's like to work with Randy Hand. You can probably imagine all... If you think stupid stuff comes out of my mouth here, you should see me in my office when he's sitting there, Right? And as you probably can imagine, over the, Lord, we've been together, what, 9, 10, 20, 50? I don't know. We're like an old couple. It's just crazy, right? <laughs> can you imagine how many times I've ticked him off? 
Right? My wife's like, yeah, I can. <laughs> my son's like, oh, absolutely. I know what you're talking about. My daughter's like, I don't know what you're talking about, Dad. I'm the favorite. Right? What I've noticed about Jason, and I've often wondered about this. I was like, is he, you know, is he weak? Is he, is he, does he just not like me enough to, t- to tell me? No. He gets mad. He waits until he's prayed about it and thought about it. And then he tells me what he's mad about the best possible way. And here's the thing. A lot of times, he didn't say anything at all. Why? Because God told him not to. He's put on the clothing of patience. And finally, what is love? What does it mean, love? It means to choose good over evil. Oh, this just hit me. Write this down. To choose good over evil means this. You focus on the good in the person and not the bad. I told my wife a long time ago. Each morning she wakes up, she has a choice. Is she going to focus on the 742 things that's bad in me? Or is she going to focus on the five or six good things in me? If my wife clothes herself like God tells her to, she will focus on the four or five good things, and she'll leave the 752 things to her Jesus. Now notice, God wants this, these clothes, to be the first thing people see. You say, Randy, why? Because of this truth. The truth is this. We must carefully choose what we show to others. We must carefully choose what we show to others. Colossians 4, 5 says, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. But not just unbelievers. Romans 13, 13 says, We must live honorably, honorable lives for all to see. You see, God's very concerned about the, how you present yourself to people. God is very concerned about what you show people. And that's why he's given us this Christian uniform for every day. Now, let me hear it. Stay with me. Y'all do realize that you know, I'm, God, has, for whatever reason, has perfected righteous anger through me. He's taught me how to be angry and sin not. But notice, he didn't tell me to make my anger the first thing people notice. Notice he didn't say anything about my holiness being the first thing that he noticed. Notice I'm not supposed to display the judgment of God. You know, some of you are still mad at me because I've spent time with a lesbian uh, a, a worker lately at a, a local place that I go to, and I have, one, I have not once told her that she's going to hell. Well, I'll go back to the list. Is me telling judgment the first impression God wants me to give her? Or is it tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love? You see, we could share a lot of things, but God says our first impression should be mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. And so we see what? Christians have choices that we need to make. We have Christians have clothes they need to put on. But notice thirdly and lastly, Christians have compassion to share. Christians have compassions to share. Colossians 3.13 says this, Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, what does it mean to make allowance for somebody? It means to bear with, endure, put up with, even to suffer for their faults. We see it in Matthew 17, 17. Jesus says, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I what? Put up with you, make allowances for you. What does he mean by forgive? The definition of forgive means to freely deliver, cancel a debt, rescue from punishment. It means they've done something against us. They deserve for us to knock them through a wall. And instead of knocking them through the wall, we rescue them from the consequences of their action. That's what it means to forgive. Luke 7.32 says this, Neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Now please don't miss this. Our job as Christians is to put up with and cancel people's mistakes, mess-ups, and failures. You hear me? Our job is to put up with, cancel people's mistakes, mess-ups, and and failures. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Randy, they just don't deserve it. Can I be honest with you? You're right. They don't. But please remember this. Remember, our all forgiveness is based on what God has done for us. All forgiveness, 
all of making allowances is based on what God has done for us. Ephesians 4.32 said it a different way. It says, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You see, me forgiving you, our forgiveness has everything to do with Jesus and has nothing to do with you. Our forgiveness has everything to do with our Savior and nothing to do with the sinner. Some of you right now are, are refusing to cancel a debt. Some of you got parents. Some of you have brothers, sisters, neighbors, co-workers. Some of you are refusing to cancel a debt with me right now. I don't know why God told me that that's happening, but okay. And you know what Jesus is saying to you? He's saying, Matthew 18, he's saying, Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Can I share with you something? This is, there's not going to be a slide for this. God just gave it to me. He reminded me that people who struggle with forgiveness have probably never been forgiven themselves. You can't give away to somebody the forgiveness of Christ if you've never truly received it yourself. Hear me. This week I was counseling with a lady, and all week long she was struggling with her flesh. All week long she was having a bad week. She knew what she was supposed to do, and she did. And this is what she said to me. She said, Randy, I'm praying. Randy, I'm praying. I keep praying, and nothing changes. Randy, I keep praying, and I don't get any better. Randy, I keep praying, 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 praying. Now, I happen to know this lady pretty well. She's been in the church family for a while. And this is what I said to her. I said, let me explain something to you. You see, God is like me. You see, God can tell when you're just going through the motions, and God can tell when you really don't mean what you pray. You're saying, Randy, how do I know if I really meant what I prayed when I asked Jesus to save me? Well, look at the fruit. Are you trying to tell me that the forgiveness of God that forgave you everything that you have committed, everything you are committing, everything that you will commit, that forgiveness of God that made you acceptable to him, that, that gave you permission, gave you the opportunity to receive a new heart and in life, you're trying to tell me that that forgiveness of God that, that some scholars have said is up to like five to seven billion dollars worth of sin that God has forgiven you for and you can't forgive somebody fifty thousand dollars? You know what that tells me? You never received the five to seven billion dollars worth of forgiveness. So do me a favor. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bowed. Every eye closed. I think I know what happened, by the way. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I think I may have figured out what, where the breakdown occurred. Why some of you have tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to get saved and yet you're failed, and you know you keep failing the fruit test. You know that there's no fruit of your salvation. You know that, there, that people can't tell that Jesus is living in you because he's not. And I think I figured out why, why you keep failing to get saved. And the why is this. You keep trying to get the second type of salvation, which is God to save you from the consequences of your sin and to save you from your lust and your pride and your ego. You keep trying to ask for the second type of salvation without ever first getting the first. Don't get them out of order. Until you get a new heart, until you get a new life, there is no salvation from sins with an S. There is no salvation for your, your, your habits and your mistakes and your failures. You've got to get, ask God to forgive you for the sin nature that you have. You've got to have, ask God to give you a new heart and a new life. You've got to be one way and then another, like Mary said in the video. So have you tried to get the second salvation, but you've never gotten the first? Has there ever been a time that you said to God, Oh God, yes I mess up, yes I do wrong, yes I sin, but God the problem is me. I'm just infected. I'm just impure. I'm, I'm just depraved. 
As Psalm 51 says, I was conceived in sin and I ain't never stopped. I received a sin nature from my daddy. Have you ever had that time where you said, Lord, I'm not going to talk about specific sins. I need you to fix me. I need you to make me whole. I need you to replace that old depraved heart with the heart of Jesus. Has there been that time? Because stop dealing with your lying. Stop dealing with your cheating. Stop dealing with your lust until you deal with your heart. And right now, In this moment, you can get a new heart. There's been hundreds of new hearts, heart transplants done in this very room. And it can be you today. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, just talk to God. Call. He's already selected you. He's already chosen you. He's already invited you. Now you just need to call back. You need to receive his invitation. You need to let him choose you. Stop listening to my voice and just start talking to him. Just say, God, I need you to heal me. I'm broke from the inside out. Oh, let me pray for you. Dear God, I just thank you for your love. (laughs) I thank you that you got to the heart of the matter, and the heart of the matter is me. And that, Lord, that's why I could get saved at five years old. Not because I knew all about my sin. Not because I had done a bunch of sin. I got saved at five years old because, Lord, even at five, I had a depraved heart that needed to be killed and to receive a new heart. That's why salvation, the first salvation, is so easy. Children can do it if they recognize their desperate need for you. And, Lord, I pray for everyone in this room. God, don't... Don't let them get the order mixed up. Lord, set them free from their their failures and their mistakes and that bad habit that brought them here. And Lord, may they deal with the heart of the problem, which is them. And give them the humility to cry out to you, to quit trying to fix themselves, quit trying to up their level of commitment because they can't commit themselves to, to heaven. Lord, work in our hearts, work in our lives. Make us miserable if we have to. It's in your name I pray. Amen.